Um, they asked me to talk about um, hydroponics for home gardeners, and honestly, you know, this would be a talk about hydroponics, whether you're doing it at home or a small commercial enterprise or a large commercial enterprise. Most of the principles don't really change a whole lot. Some of the equipment might change from um, one setting to another, but most of the principles would remain the same. And so uh, I guess I should give a little bit of detail about myself. Uh, my name is Jeff Kindart. I'm a senior research specialist with the Department of Crop Sciences at the University of Illinois. I have worked for the U of I since 1990 as a horticulturist, and I am housed at the Dixon Springs Ag Center, which is an experiment station 30 miles north of Paducah, Kentucky. So basically, I typically work with people in the southern third of the state, although I have responsibility for commercial horticulture all over the state. Okay, so I think where to start at, we have to start with the definition. Hydroponic literally refers to water at work is the literal translation, and intuitively it's growing plants without soil. And the opposite of hydroponic or the, the other choice would be growing plants geoponically, that is, with dirt. Um, and in a hydroponic setting, we provide all of the essential elements through the solution in water. And the term is certainly not new. It first appears in the literature in 1939, although we'll talk about the history. It's probably been going on even longer than that. Uh-oh skipped ahead. Why would a homeowner or a commercial person, either one, be interested in, in uh, uh, hydroponic production? It, it affords for more stable yields. It allows for very rap rapid crop development. For example, in the case of tomatoes, if we were to set them in soil and set them into hydroponics, I think we could easily anticipate harvesting the first ripe fruit a full 10 days, if not more, earlier in the hydroponic setting. And part of the reason for that rapid crop development is because the plants are not having to grow an extensive root system looking for food. We're providing everything that they need, and since they're spending less time and energy developing a a substantial and significant root system that allows them to invest more energy in the shoot and the crop that is developing. Another thing that hydroponics affords us is the ability to avoid soil-borne pathogens. Things like Phytophthora, which are common soil-borne pathogens, are typically not a problem in a hydroponic setting because there is no soil element to a hydroponic setting. Hydroponics also allows us to have crop production where there is no soil, such as on top of a roof, or if we have contaminated soil. In urban settings, it's fairly common uh, that a city or municipality might donate uh, a vacant lot or two for people to grow food crops on. Well, in many cases, there's enough arsenic and lead and other things in that soil that it may not really be the very best site for growing food crops on, but we can take that same site and practice hydroponic production where we're growing the crop above the soil and have perfectly good success. Another advantage of hydroponics is that the medias that we use don't weigh very much, and because of that, it allows us to have vertical growing. And one of the last things we'd like to talk about for an advantage of hydroponics is that it affords some degree of food safety, although not always. Most of the time, hydroponic production is carried out at least in a structure like a high tunnel, uh, something where we've got some degree of protection and we have less problems with, as there's no soil, we're not having soil and the pathogens contained there within splashed up onto the crop when it rains. For example, lettuce growing out in your garden, every time it rains, it splashes soil and water up onto the lettuce crop. And if a deer has just walked through there and gone to the bathroom, then this is a chance to introduce E. coli. Uh, we have a little bit different setting. Since there is no soil anywhere around in the hydroponic setting, uh, we don't have as much problem with things splashing up and contaminating our crop. 
along with the good, there is always bad, and there are some disadvantages to hydroponics. We are on slide number five. I, I just saw that pop up there anyway. Sorry, answered that question. Uh, disadvantages is that there is little or no buffering capacity. If we're running a hydroponic system that's driven by pumps, if we lose power, then we lose water circulation. And if that can happen, we can have an absolute disaster in as little as an hour in a greenhouse setting. If you were doing hydroponics in your basement, you might get by for a couple of hours. But uh, if we don't have uh, water or we don't have power, if we lose either one of those two elements, uh, we can have an absolute disaster in a short period of time because of the lack of buffering capacity built into these systems. They do require a little bit higher level of management, and there is some expense associated with them. The equipment and supplies and labor are all going to be greater in a hydroponic system. However, typically the yield is also better. So it is expensive. It's not necessarily more expensive in terms of the number of pounds of tomatoes you grow or the numbers of heads of lettuce that you produce but it is going to be uh, some additional expenses over just growing something out in a garden, for example. And lastly, the disadvantage is if you're interested in organic production, it is difficult and maybe even impossible to conduct hydroponics using uh, only materials allowed under organic production auspices as listed on the OMRI index. Um, it, it's just difficult to do that way. We can do this production pesticide free, but some of the materials that we're going to use as fertilizer sources, fertilizer sources uh, will not comply with organic standard. So a little bit about the history. You know, it may go back as far as the ancient gardens of Babylon. Historians would debate whether or not that's accurate or not. But certainly it was being done as early as the 1600s, although the people didn't really understand what it was that they were doing. In the 30s, we start 1930s. We started doing some uh, extensive research with it, and a couple of the guys that were involved in that initial research, uh, one of them's name was Hoagland. And if you read much about hydroponics, you'll start reading about Hoagland's solution, uh, and that is the fertilizer recipe that was developed by one of these early researchers into hydroponic production. Hydroponics, our knowledge of hydroponics expanded greatly in the 40s, and the reason for that was during World War II, we had lots of troops stationed on Pacific Rim Islands or near Pacific Rim Islands, and they really are soilless atolls, and they don't have any ability to produce fresh fruits or vegetables, and so in order for us to provide particularly fresh vegetables to the troops, there was a lot of hydroponic production that was done during World War II, and really things are no different today than they were back then. When the military puts its economic might and mind behind getting something accomplished, that tends to happen, and we had a great increase in our understanding and knowledge base of hydroponics during the 40s. And I think the thing that brought hydroponics to the absolute forefront with the opening of Epcot Center in the 80s, everybody went through and saw the display, and it is absolutely fantastic. If you've not been there, you can go on YouTube and type in Epcot Center Hydroponic, and it'll give you all kinds of videos, and it is absolutely amazing, the hydroponic production that they have on display there. Hey, Jeff, can I stop you a second? Sure. Uh, when you change slides, can you let them know? We've got okay. a, we've got a couple people running from the CD, so they need to know when not, to go to the next slide. Not a problem. I okay. mean, is my voice working okay? Too yeah, fast, yeah, you, too you, you sound great. They just weren't sure which slide you're on. No, no, no problem. We've moved to slide seven. Thank you. I'm an old school teacher, so I can make a beep sound like we used to have with our slide <laughs> sets. That was whatever you got to do. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Um, on slide seven, we're talking about CELLS, which was a program from NASA called Controlled Ecological Life Support Systems. And the reason that NASA has been interested in hydroponic production is this. If we're really going to travel to planets that may be a year or two away, we cannot pack enough food on the spaceship to feed the people that are going to be traveling for that year or two in time. Therefore, they're going to have to be able to raise their own food 
in order to make this thing work. If we packed enough food for them to eat for their entire journey, uh, the ship would weigh so much that it couldn't possibly get off the ground. So they're going to have to be able to raise their own produce. And because of that, NASA has spent a great deal of money uh, in terms of research dollars looking at hydroponic production. And we've changed slides to slide number eight. So let's talk a little bit about hydroponic production. And, and basically, there are a couple of different ways we could classify hydroponics. Uh, this is one of the ways we could, we could classify it. Hydroponic systems may be static, like you see in the upper right slide, where we just have water in some sort of enclosure. And typically in that setting, we will have an air pump, similar to what you would find on aquarium, and some air stones that bubble oxygen into the water or bubble air into the water uh, so that it does not become stagnant. We can also have systems that have intermittent flow where um, rather than the water circulating all the time, it may circulate for, for example, we're going to look at Dutch buckets and tomato production at some point during this presentation. And in a tomato system, we would let water run for about 30 seconds every 25 or 30 minutes. And that, that's all. And so the flow is intermittent. And there are also systems where we have a pump and we have a continuous flow of nutrient solution across the root system. Uh, this is very common with uh, nutrient film technique, such as the lettuce you see being grown in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, where we have gutter systems and nutrient solution is pumped through that system all of the time. Oh, I'm sorry, it advanced like two. Um, when we start looking at, at systems for homeowners, it, you know, here's an amazing system for growing hydroponics. It is a rotary system, and you have a central light source, and you can get the maximum amount of production from a single light bulb utilizing this rotary system. So it offers a great deal of efficiency in terms of capturing and utilizing the energy that we spent on making the light bulb burn. But unfortunately, this system is so expensive that commercially it's probably not very plausible. Now on slide 10, we've advanced. And one of the problems, particularly for homeowner settings, is that much of the hydroponic supplies and equipment is priced for individuals that are interested in growing their own um, recreational cannabis. And that being the case, the value of that crop is so high, um, you know, we're talking about $5,000 a pound as opposed to basil being worth $20 a pound. You know, there's a big difference in the economics behind cannabis versus other things. And those of you that are really wanting to do this as homeowners, you need to be cautious that you're buying a system that is actually justifiable in terms of the dollars that you're going to have to spend. Uh, we're going to skip slide 11, and we're going to go on to slide 12. Here's a, a, a kind of a different way of looking at, you know, we said earlier that we had one method of classifying hydroponic systems would be by whether or not they were static, intermittent, or continuous flow. There are other mechanisms or classification systems for hydroponics. Um, and up in the upper right-hand picture, you're seeing floating raft culture, which was commonly used for lettuce production in Illinois and other places uh, in the 1990s. And it's still used some now, but largely it's been replaced by a different system we'll talk about in just a second, and that is uh, the next one on the list, nutrient film technique, where we're growing the lettuce and gutters, like you see in the bottom right. And, and we'll talk more about each of these systems. We'll also talk about ebb and flow hydroponic systems, as well as soilless media culture, which is probably the thing most common for tomato and cucumber production. Um, and they would be growing the plants in something like rock wool or perlite. We're on slide 13 now. So let's look real quick at a floating raft system. Uh, in a floating raft system, and these can be really quite easily built. Uh, you take some concrete blocks, lay them on a uh, floor or 
uh, out in the yard somewhere where we've got you know an area where we're not going to punch holes in the in the liner that we're going to place in it. Uh, once we have the hydroponic, per, I mean the um, concrete block perimeter set up, you know you can take material just like polyethylene, like Visqueen, if you will, and, and lay down to make a um, a small shallow pool. And in these floating raft systems, the roots are continuously floating in water. Typically, we take styrofoam like you would use, four by eight sheets of styrofoam like you would use for insulation inside your house. And we cut that styrofoam down into smaller chunks. We cut holes into the styrofoam to allow our plant to be inserted. And you can see a raft uh, that you, know, you see in the upper right-hand picture right there. The seedlings are started in typically rock wool some form of soilless media and as soon as the seed seedling has started to develop and has a leaf or two it is then transferred over into the raft and it's going to spend its entire life cycle in the raft up until harvest time the requirements for this system to work is that we do have to have root aeration we have to have some mechanism of circulating the water and we have to have some mechanism of oxygenating the water it is important that if you look in the bottom right, you can see how a bunch of that tank is open. That can never be really done in commercial production or homeowner production. If that solution there contains all of the nutrients necessary to grow really good lettuce, it also contains all the nutrients necessary to grow a whole lot of algae really, really quickly. And therefore, we want to maintain total darkness on the tank. So you can have a situation like you see in the bottom right in terms of we don't have to have production across the whole tank, but we would want to fill in those open areas with chunks of styrofoam that didn't have any holes punched in them to keep the light from getting down to where the nutrient solution is located at. It's, it's mandatory that we don't have light reaching that tank. Um, and, and that's a little bit about floating raft system. It was used a lot, again, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, has largely been replaced by other mechanisms at this point in time. The benefits of the floating raft system, you know, it doesn't cost much to build. You know, again, some concrete blocks and some plastic, uh, some styrofoam and some knives to cut it into uh, the pieces that we're going to use for rafts. It's really nice from a labor point of view in that we can move plants by simply pushing and the entire bed of plants moves down through the trough. Um, and, and it is something that you would see quite a bit of if you were looking at an aquaponic system where we had both plants and animals being raised in the same system. The biggest drawback for the floating raft system is that since all the plants are suspended in the same tank of water that is sitting there continuously, if we would have a disease like Pythium start anywhere in the, in the production area, it spreads rapidly and can cause damage to the entire crop that's laying there floating. And, and that is a significant and substantial threat. We're now on slide 15. We, t we, we pointed out aeroponic systems, and if you have been to the Epcot Center, they have some really cool aeroponic systems and in aeroponic systems the roots are bathed in a very fine mist of hydroponic solution it is commonly used for plant physiology studies uh, there's some neat slide sets or video footage where NASA has done some work with it but in all honesty the system is not commonly used for commercial production and not what I would recommend you uh, go home and try to practice in a home gardening setting. And the reason for that is this. The nozzles that are required are relatively expensive to purchase and because they are quite small in terms of their orifice size, they are pretty much in continual need of maintenance. Uh, the system is one of the more expensive to establish and one of the more time consuming to maintain and I think we can get pretty much to almost as good a results from other systems that are uh, one cheaper to put into place and cheaper to operate and require less time. We're on slide 16 now. 
I'm sorry. I skipped ahead. The benefits of aeroponic systems are it does provide a highly oxygenated environment for the root system. And, you know, if, you know, I said earlier that you would see it in some of the NASA footage. NASA is interested in using it to grow things like potatoes. The drawback is the expense and the amount of energy required uh, for these systems. There are some pictures on slide 17 of, of aeroponic systems. Uh, just for thorough, you know, for completeness, we're going to look at all of them. So that that's kind of what an aeroponic system would look like. This is nutrient film technique, and this is the way that most of the lettuce would be raised hydroponically in Illinois or, or honestly anywhere throughout the Midwest. It is a little bit similar to the floating raft system in that you know, the plants are grown and they're being continuously bathed in nutrient film technique, but are in nutrient solution. But the difference, if you look at the picture, there's just a small amount of water trickling down that gutter continuously. The nutrient solution is pumped to the high end of the gutter, where it trickles down the gutter and returns back to the holding tank for further recirculation. Uh, and this is normally done on a continuous basis. That system, that pump runs 24 hours a day. Um, but the pump is only raising the nutrient solution up to the beginning, and then gravity takes care of returning it back to the tank. This sort of recirculating system is relatively economical to purchase and operate and maintenance requirements are minimal. It has many advantages and that's why it has become so popular. Moving on to slide 19. The benefits are we have good oxygenation, almost as good as an aeroponic system, not quite, but almost. And it can be constructed from materials that are relatively cheap to buy. You can even build your own out of home gutters. I'll be very honest with you, I would not recommend constructing your own. You can buy ones that come pre-punched with everything you need for just a little bit more money, and they're set up where they're going to actually work. By the time you mess up on trying to make a homemade one and wind up buying part of the pieces twice because you did something wrong, you could have bought a system that was put together, ready to go. All you had to do was take it out of the box and put it together. Drawbacks of this system are that the troughs can get clogged uh, by a massive root system that does wind up developing, particularly as we near harvest time, and that can result in us having some uh, an occasional problem with troughs that overflow and, and those kinds of things. But in general, in general, nutrient film technique are relatively problem free. This system is, is most commonly utilized for things like lettuce and herbs. You will see some pictures of strawberries being raised in this way. Um, it's not my favorite way for raising strawberries hydroponically. We'll, we'll show you some pictures of how we like to do that. But it can be used for even for some small fruit production like for strawberries. Okay, another type of system we've, we've looked at floating raft, we've looked at aeroponic systems, we've looked at uh, nutrient film technique systems. Another type of system is called an ebb and flow system. And if you'll look, what's going to happen here, the, the bench that you see down on the bottom right is a common commercial ebb and flow bench. And you would simply put a standpipe in the hole. You would take a pump and it would fill that bench up with about two inches of hydroponic nutrient solution you would let that bench remain full of hydroponic solution for, oh, maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Then we pull the pipe and redrain all the solution back to the tank. This is not used commonly for food, pro food crop production in Illinois, but it is common with some of the ornamentals, some things like uh, some of the primroses, some of the African violets that have a tendency to the foliage becomes spotted if it's hit with cold water. We can use a bench like this or you know, an ebb and flow system, and we can water the plants from the bottom, 
and not have any problems. So ebb and flow systems are used, but they're probably more common in ornamental horticulture rather than food crop horticulture. Uh, again, popular for potted, uh, we've moved to slide 21, popular for potted ornamentals. Uh, roots are relatively well oxygenated. Um, you know, it, it, it's a neat system, probably best reserved for ornamentals. Here's the other system, or, or we're going to start talking about soilless cultural systems, and there's four or five different medias that can be used in soilless culture systems, and this may be a little bit different than what most of you think about when you think about hydroponics, but uh, here's some plants being grown in rock wool, and this is going to be hydroponic, even though there is a media that the plants are going to be growing in. That media doesn't contain any soil. We have to provide all the nutrients through hydroponic solution. Um, and, and the first one we're going to look at here is rock wool. We're on, now on slide 23. Rock wool comes in a lot of different sizes, and it can be used to accommodate the crop from germination all the way through maturity. If you will remember back to the gutter systems that we looked at for growing lettuce, the way that would normally work is that you would germinate your seed in a rock wool block like you see in the upper right-hand corner. Once that seed had germinated and developed a couple of leaves, those little blocks tear apart and that gutter is actually punched with a hole that corresponds to the size of rock wool that you've bought so that you then take your little seedling and just with the rock wool still on the bottom and move it over and slide it down into the gutter where it catches and it will spend its entire rest of its production cycle over in that gutter but it gets started in this rock wool block. Down at the bottom right, you're seeing tomatoes being grown in larger rock wool slabs. Uh, the things that you would see most commonly, slab production like this, uh, tomatoes and cucumbers, as well as peppers, I guess, uh, all three of those commodities can be raised this way. This system is very popular in certain regions. It is probably not the most common system in the Midwest. Uh, if you go out to Arizona, uh, you know, some of the western states you'll see more of this. In the Midwest we tend to use other systems other than rock wool labs. This would be one of the other systems that we would use and that would be growing plants in some sort of container filled with perlite. And perlite I think all of you are familiar with. It's the white stuff that's coming in your potting soil. It is a material that is mined or, or quarried from the earth it is heated to 760 degrees C and it pretty much pops like popcorn at that point and it offers a lot of great things it has a high water holding capacity and in addition it has not very much cation exchange capacity so it doesn't retain many nutrients and that's a good thing because that allows us to not have problems with nutrients becoming out of balance during the life of our hydroponic solution. I mean during the life of our hydroponic production. There is really no nutrient value of any consequence to perlite and so even though we're growing plants in perlite the system is still entirely hydroponic. Moving to slide Every time I hit it, I advance to, I apologize. Moving to slide 25, vermiculite is another choice, but in general, we prefer perlite over vermiculite for uh, production because vermiculite does have a tendency to retain some of the plant nutrients that we put on, and it can result in plant nutrition problems because nutrients become out of balance. So vermiculite is a choice, but it's not a very, a very good one. One of the cho another choice that is pretty good is the use of soilless, I'm sorry, of, of coconut core or cocoa core. And, and cocoa core is ground up coconut palm husk. And it has good uh, water holding capacity, good aeration. It has a great pH. It does have, again, a little bit like perlite, some problems. I'm sorry, a little bit like vermiculite. It does have problems with cation exchange capacity being a bit higher than we would like, 
um, but we don't seem to have as many problems with it as we tend to have with just using vermiculite alone. Um, the biggest problem with this is that this coconut core is shipped to you in compressed blocks like you see on the bottom left. I'm sure that most of you have at some point in your gardening career played with jiffy pellets where you uh, you know, have a disc that's the size of about a silver dollar. You put it in water and it swells up and makes uh, a little uh, area where you can grow your, your plant. Well, this thing is a little bit similar to that in that it comes in a block that's about uh, 12 inches by 12 inches by 6 inches thick. And when we add water to this particular block, it basically fills up a 35-gallon ca trash can. Uh, it's like a jiffy pellet uh, on steroids. It, 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 it's, it's really fun. It's really neat. Uh, it's also relatively labor-intensive and can be just a little bit expensive. So coconut core is a great thing to start with for beginners because it has such a high water holding capacity. It is very forgiving. Uh, but I think as most growers become more advanced, they switch from coconut core to other substrates like perlite, which we talked about earlier. The benefits of coconut core, it, you know, it's very renewable. We're growing more coconuts all the time. We have a continuous source of coconut husk, and so it is a highly renewable commodity. Um, probably better, you know, it's it's easier to recycle than, than rock wool, you know, you simply take it out and dump it on your garden. Um, and in some cases, we may even inoculate the coconut core with some beneficial microbes to cut down on insect and disease problems. So there are some benefits of cocoa core. The biggest drawback, I think, is that it becomes relatively expensive to purchase initially, and it takes a great deal of labor investment in order to get it into the stage where it's ready for using in a hydroponic system. And lastly, we need to talk about aquaponics. There's, you know, for the last five years, there's been a great amount of hoopla over aquaponics, and, and aquaponics is hydroponics plus aquaculture. So we are going to add some sort of aquatic organism. It could be fish. It could be uh, what they call freshwater prawn, which is really a crayfish. Uh, there, there are a number of different choices that can be used for the aquatic organism, but we use the two at the same time. And the theory behind it is absolutely beautiful in that you know you've got a plant that's um, you've got a plant that requires nitrogen to grow. And you have an aquatic organism that produces nitrogenous waste as just part of its being alive. And so you've got these two things that can bounce and nutrient cycle back and forth between each other. And it's a really neat, neat concept. Uh, there are some problems, though, in terms of its implementation. And let's see if I can advance. We're on slide 29. When we start running an aquaponic solution or an aquaponic system, we have to reduce the amount of fertilizer that we're putting in the water to grow the plants because if we were to use the full amount that we would normally use for plant production, the water would be so salty it would kill the aquatic organism. So we're typically running at somewhere between 5 to 40 percent of what we would normally run in ideal hydroponic settings. Uh, so slide 30 poses the question, hydroponics versus aquaponics, and you know which of these two crops is the important one, the organism that we're raising for uh, typically meat purposes or the organism that is the vegetable component? Slide 31, the plants certainly survive an aquaponic solution. You know, there are some examples of some being grown on campus. The plants can do quite well. Slide 32, but do they thrive? Do they do as well as if they were just growing in a hydroponic setting? Well, most of the people who are involved in aquaponics will tell you that about 90% of the profit 
comes from the vegetable component in the aquaponic system. So we said earlier that we're throttling down this system by 50% or more in terms of the amount of plant material that we're going to produce. And the plant material is going to comprise 90% of the profitability at the end of the fiscal year. So do the systems work? Yes. Do they make a lot of sense economically? For a lot of people, the honest answer is no, they don't. So that's kind of all we're going to do about um, uh, aquaponics. It, it, it's great. It's very neat. Um, it's got some drawbacks, though, and, and the principal one being that you have to throttle the production of the plants quite significantly. So we've kind of done a whirlwind of hydroponics. Let's sort of look at some more concrete examples. You know, what, what is it that we actually see people using in Illinois? We said earlier, ebb and flow, but only in ornamentals. So here's some examples of others. Here's a gutter system that this particular one is called an aeroflow system. It can be purchased from a lot of different sources. It works really good. This particular one is in my greenhouse here. It would be very well adapted to sitting in someone's basement with grow lights or in a little hobby greenhouse out behind the house. It is a very nice system that does a very excellent job of raising um, really lots of different things. We've grown all kinds of things in it, but it particularly shines for things like lettuce and other greens. Uh, here's an example of lettuce close to harvest time. And again, I mean, it's kind of neat. That slide was taken on November the 18th. I mean, it's hard to find good lettuce on November the 18th, and I assure you that stuff there is absolutely top quality. back up. The drawback to this system is that it's very expensive. You know, one of these, um, you know, you're probably going to have nine or ten dollars per planting hole invested in the system. And that's that's great if you're doing it for fun in your basement. You'll be very successful and I think in the end would more than justify paying for this system. Commercially, it's a little bit hard to justify spending that much money on the system when there are cheaper choices. This is the choice that would be used in larger commercial settings. And again, these are the gutters that we've talked about before. It's a little bit similar to the aeroflow system that we've just looked at, but the troughs are typically 10 foot long or the gutters are 10 foot long. It's a little bit bigger system. Now, just so you understand, you can buy very small versions of this system. We have one that we use here that only has four gutters, um, and and it's going to run somewhere around, um, you know, uh, again probably six or seven dollars a planting hole, um, but I think it will be a little bit cheaper than the Aeroflow system. And in fact, uh, some of these smaller systems, like the one that you can buy from Crop King, for example would actually come if you'd like to purchase it. Uh, they even have a deal where it will come so that you can put a light right on top of it. It comes with a light rack already made on it. All you have to do is hang your, your fluorescent lamp and you're off to growing year round. We skip slide 37. Uh, we're now on slide 38. And on slide 38, I, I need to visit with you about something else that, that we haven't talked about yet. There are two kinds of hydroponic systems, like in the gutters and the aeroflow that we just looked at. That nutrient solution goes through the system and goes back to a holding tank and gets recirculated. In the floating raft system that we talked about earlier, where we have the styrofoam floating on top of the hydroponic tank, if you will. That nutrient solution stays there all the time. Those are called, you know, recirculating or captive hydroponic systems, and they are what you probably are most familiar with. There are other types of systems that are called run to waste, meaning that we put on fresh water and hydroponic solution and whatever runs out the bottom of the pot is in fact not recirculated. Now when most people hear this they become upset and you know and they think 
well, that's an economic, I mean, that is an environmentally terrible system, the run to waste system. It's much better when we have this continuous recirculating system. But what you need to understand is that in continuous recirculating systems, we have to dump all of the water in the system about every 10 days and start fresh. We have to do that for a couple of reasons. One, plants exude hormones out through their root system, and so we have problems with hormones that sort of mess up nutrient uptake by the root system of the plants. And so as those hormones accumulate over time, you know, by day eight or nine, we don't have as good of growth as we had on day one. So again, on about a 10-day cycle, we dump those systems out and start fresh. In addition to plant hormones accumulating, we also have problems with nutrients becoming out of balance. You're going to buy a hydroponic fertilizer solution that has all the nutrients in there at specific ratios one to another. And over time, those things can get out of the correct ratios that are ideal for plant growth. And that's another reason why we have to dump those tanks out. In the run to waste systems where we're going to put on fresh water and hydroponic fertilizer, and what runs out the bottom of the pot is lost. We adjust those systems, they're run by timers, and we adjust those systems, we measure how much hydroponic solution we're putting on and how much is running out, what the effluent of the system is. And we adjust the times so that we are only having about 10% effluent. So if you'll do the math with me, if we're blowing off 10% of all that we put on across a 10-day period, it would be 100%. Or if we have a great big tank that we're recirculating, but every 10 days we dump 100% of the tank, then please understand that there's not a great deal of difference in between these two systems in terms of their impact on the environment. I believe all the rest of the things that we're going to look at today are going to be run to waste systems. And here is a typical example of how a run to waste system would work. You see we've got tanks here and those tanks are filled with fertilizer solution. One contains all of the hydroponic elements except for calcium nitrate. The second tank contains calcium nitrate. The third tank contains an acidifying agent that's commonly used commercially, probably would not be used for most of you in a home garden setting, but you would have to have two tanks. The stuff is then mixed and injected out through the system. Here's another example of you know, a, a smaller system. Again, this time we don't have an acidifying agent. Um, and I'm sorry, we're on slide 40 at this point. Um, we don't have an acidifying agent, so we only have two tanks. The one tank contains all of the plant elements except for calcium nitrate, and the calcium nitrate is contained in the second tank. The reason that we have to have calcium nitrate maintained in a second tank all by itself is that we also always use magnesium sulfate, and if calcium nitrate and magnesium sulfate get close to one another, in a concentrated setting like in these stock tanks, we wind up making a, a, basically it's drywall. You make this white precipitate that is water insoluble and it plugs up everything in our system. So we always keep calcium nitrate separate from all of the rest of it up until right before it's going to go on the plant material. Regardless of whether you're going to use a run to waste system or a recirculating system, one of the things that you're really going to have to do if you're going to raise plants hydroponically, and I think this is true even for those in a, uh, uh, in a home setting, you're going to have to have a meter that will tell you the pH of the hydroponic solution and the EC. The EC stands for electrical conductivity, and it's telling us you know, how salty is the solution that we're putting on the plants. The way that we know whether or not we're putting enough fertilizer on is by catching a sample of the hydroponic solution and measuring it for what its EC is. You know, if it's if it's too low of an EC, then we've got we're diluting it too much, and we change our adjustments so that it's run at a more concentrated level. But you have to have a pH and an EC meter. 
Here's some examples of strawberries being grown. I told you earlier that we did not like strawberries that were raised in troughs. I mean, it's just not my favorite method. I like this vertical stacking system like you see on slide 42 here. And this is, oh, skipped ahead on me. And here's slide 43. And, and again, we talked earlier about vertical integration. These are hydroponic strawberries. We have 16 plants being grown in each stack. Um, and and we've got, we're getting better use of, you know, a greenhouse setting or better use of our grow light because we have got vertical integration of our plant material. This works really, really well. Slide 44 showing some of the lettuce that can be raised hydroponically, uh, as is slide 45. There are some beets and some carrots on slide 46 and 47. And there's a strawberry, the crop that we're really after, uh, in slide 48. But these vertical stacking systems can be used to grow a lot more than just strawberries. Slide 49 is showing you leeks being grown hydroponically in a vertical stacking system. In this case, instead of them being grown in perlite, they're being grown in coconut core, which we talked about earlier. Uh, if you want to have all of your neighbors run whenever they see your car pull up, try growing some hydroponic basil like you see here in slide 50. You will wind up picking garbage bags of the material every week. You'll have so much of it that you will give it away to everybody to the point where they don't want to see you anymore because you're always bringing them basil. Uh, basil works incredibly well in hydroponic systems. Uh, here's squash in a vertical system. You can do tomatoes, but we're going to look in a minute at a lot better way to do the tomatoes if you're wanting to do them hydroponically. And one of the neat things about hydroponics, you know, as a horticulturist, you know, classically trained, all that good stuff, you know, I knew that you couldn't raise lettuce in the summertime because it was always bitter. Here's an example of a head of lettuce that was picked out of those vertical stacking systems that we were just looking at. And on the day it was harvested, it was 102 degrees in the high tunnel when we picked it. One intuitively would think that lettuce would be poor quality, but it was not. Because the root system is kept cool, and it's kept cool because it's being grown in a white styrofoam pot using white media. And in addition to that, we're putting fresh water on, you know, lots of fresh water on, or lots of cold water on that plant throughout the day. The root system stays cool, and the quality of the lettuce is outstanding. Even though the air temperature is 102, the lettuce is not milky or bitter. And in fact, it's most excellent. So, I don't know, it's kind of a cool thing about hydroponics. Now let's switch gears, and, and, and I think we'll probably end on this topic, talking about tomato production, because tomatoes work incredibly well, just as well. You know, lettuce works super great in hydroponic systems, as do other greens, and tomatoes also work extremely well in hydroponic systems. Some of our growers use bag systems, and if you have access to concrete, bag systems work great. This is hydroponic, you know, in this case, uh, this particular grower was using coconut core, putting it into the bags, and as you can see, we've got timers and, and lines that put hydroponic solution on, and the timers control how often that goes on, but in the case of tomatoes, for example, it would be kind of, you know, uh, an approximate number would be, you know, we would run nutrient solution on for maybe 20 seconds every 20 minutes. And then, you know, it would sit static the rest of that time in that 20 minutes. The next 20 minute cycle came around and the nutrient solution would again run for 20 minutes. The problem with this bag system is that all of the excess water, even though it's only 10%, all of that excess water drains onto the floor. And if you have concrete, like in this case, there's growing on an old abandoned hog house site, that's fine. The water runs to the sides and, and, and we get rid of it. But if you have a dirt floor or you're just growing this outside, you wind up with having a very muddy and unpleasant environment that you have to walk through to pick your produce. So 
Bag system is great if you've got a concrete floor. Probably not so great uh, in, in a setting if we're going to try to be growing over the top of dirt uh, or, or soil. Slide 57, again, is just sort of a shot of the um, lines that provided the hydroponic solution. Uh, this is a different grower in, in southern Illinois, but again, um, he's on an abandoned hog house site, so he's got access to concrete. You know, if you have a slope patio floor, hey, this is great. Bag culture will work fine for you, and it's cheaper than other settings. If you're going to try to adopt a small area or try to do this in your basement, then bag culture is really not very good. You don't want hydroponic solution running all over your basement floor. This is a different system where this is called a Dutch bucket system. And in a Dutch bucket system, I'll show you a picture of it here again in just a second. Uh, I guess we'll get to that in a minute. But in a Dutch bucket system, these buckets sit on top of an inch and a half piece of PVC pipe. And so all the water that drains from the Dutch bucket drains into the inch and a half pipe. And it can be carried away to either a floor drain if it's in your basement or carried away to the end of the greenhouse if it's a, a greenhouse setting um, and and we've got a dirt floor in the greenhouse. Oh, slide 60. Now, let me let me back up and show you why we talked earlier that one of the advantages of hydroponic is rapid crop growth. Slide 59 is showing you tomatoes, a picture taken on the 5th of March. And slide 60 shows you those same tomato plants on the 28th of June. So you can see they're, you know, well, actually, if we go to the next slide, you get an even better perspective of how tall those plants are and how much growth we have had across the three and a half month period. I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal the growth and the yield that hydroponics can result in. I give you another example, you know, in the case of lettuce, where it might take you 50 or 60 days to make a lettuce head out in the garden. In a hydroponic setting, you're probably looking at 30 to 40 days. So plant growth is much more rapid in these systems. Uh, here's a, some examples of, you know, different location of a Dutch bucket system, and you can see the inch and a half pipe that the water drains into running down in between those spots. And I'll be honest with you, there is there is a great deal of satisfaction of going out to a greenhouse uh, in, in February or March and picking red, ripe, delicious hydroponic tomatoes. I mean, it is, it's very nice to not, you know, the only month I don't get to eat BLTs down here is December. Other than that, we have tomatoes all year round. So there are some other slides of some hydroponic tomato production. We're now at slide 66 to give you an idea of, of yield. And, you know, normally we consider 10 pounds of plant of number one fruit production to be a good yield. These are hydroponic tomatoes. They were seeded on the 20th of November. Um, and we harvested uh, up through June the 25th, and we picked 34.2 pounds of number one fruit per plant. So, you know, three times as much as what we would pick in a field setting in this hydroponic environment. Even more exciting, or at least equally exciting, is that we were able to pick 20 pounds a plant of heirloom tomatoes tomato varieties that normally we wind up culling, throwing away 90 to 95 percent of all of the fruit that we pick because of how severely they wind up being cracked, we are able to pick 20 pounds a plant of number one fruit of even heirlooms. And that's, you know, that's very exciting and a, and a great uh, uh, advantage that hydroponic production affords us. So anyway, with that, that's my name. I don't know that that's particularly pertinent, but I wanted to try to get done in time to answer some questions if I can figure out how that's going to work. Jeff, there's Candace. one in the chat box, chat box asking about what type of medium was in those black bags that you're showing. In the black bags, it depended on which grower. The very first black bags or grow bags that you saw 
that particular grower used only coconut core. The second grower that we worked with uses a combination of 50% coconut core and 50% perlite. He mixes the two together. Um, and the Dutch buckets growers will normally use just 100% perlite. Uh, we have a question in Champaign County. Uh huh. Do you see hydroponics as the answer to the basil blight problem? Is that the only way we're going to be able to grow basil? I don't know that it's the only way. I do think that when you start talking about protected culture and when you start talking about protected culture, then that helps us deal with lots of different disease problems uh, because we have a much greater control of the environment. When we start talking about raising plants in protected culture, then hydroponics really shines because of the amount of growth you get on a per square foot basis out of that expensive piece of real estate being used for protected culture. Um, we've got some more in the chat box here. Uh, do you heat the high tunnels or hoop houses or just use solar heat? On uh, Okay, that's kind of a different, you know, the definition of a high tunnel, by, by very definition, it can't have heat, otherwise it becomes a greenhouse. Very honestly, those terms get misused a lot in the entire Midwest or honestly throughout the U.S. But um, in, a, in a strict high tunnel setting, we can't provide any supplemental heat. And we do have growers that are both ways. I, have, I work with growers that will start plants in March inside of their structures, which is far too cool. We have to provide some kind of heat. And most of those growers are utilizing large um, boilers that burn firewood. Uh, when you open up the boiler, it'll take about, uh, oh, a third of a pickup load of wood at a time at a single firing. So you can back up to the boiler, load it up at 9 o'clock at night, and except for the very coldest nights when we're getting down to zero, you know, we don't have to come back and refire that boiler until 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning. We've got another question in Champaign County. I have a question about the quality of the tomatoes that you're growing uh, in this environment. Are they similar to what I call the baseballs that you can buy in the grocery store or do, are they like what you would grow in your garden to, to be very honest with you they're 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 better than what most of us are growing in our gardens and they're better for two reasons one now, now let me rephrase that i i didn't know what part of the state are you from ma'am hang on say that again central what part of the state central illinois Okay, Central Illinois, your tomatoes are a little bit better than ours in Southern Illinois. In Southern Illinois, we wind up getting short on potassium, and I have seen some even in Central Illinois. When you go out and pick in uh, your tomatoes in August and you cut across the cross-section of them, you'll wind up with a white streak or a cord or a thread in the sidewalls, and sometimes they even have a green core. That's wholly related to potassium nutrition. And it's less of a problem in central Illinois. It's a very common problem in southern Illinois and a problem that we don't see at all in hydroponic production. As far as fruit firmness and the baseball question that you pose, you know, in all honesty, uh, again, I told you we can raise heirlooms hydroponically and some of the very best Cherokee purples that I have ever eaten because they were actually not cracked. They were number one quality fruit with no cracks or blemishes in them came out of hydroponic production. Yes, I'd like to go back a few pages, Jeff, on sure. the Rockwell that you talk about as a medium of growing. Yes. Is that the same Rockwell that is used in household insulation? It, it, it is similar stuff, although it's spun much finer than that. You know, I mean, in that old Rockwell insulation that used to be used, that was... Um, the fibers themselves were relatively coarse. Uh, it kind of looked almost like dog hair. And the fibers in this material would be quite a bit finer spun than that. Okay. Well, another it, is, it, is the same, it is the same parent material being used for both of them, yes. 
Okay. One other question. The effluvium that's created from all this type yes. of hydroponic gardening, yes. how does that compare to natural farming in the soil? You mean in runoff. terms of the absolute amount of runoff? Is that what you're referring to? I mean, and the quality of the runoff is it as less polluted than would be a runoff from an ordinary field? I I don't. Uh, first of all, I I'm not intelligent enough to answer that question. But let me let me dodge it just a little bit by making this statement, and that is, there's no reason why the effluent, for example, coming out of the greenhouse could not be collected in tanks and then turned around and trucked to other areas of the you know of the farm commercially or out to your garden spot where you're raising your pumpkins, tomatoes and other things and putting that nutrient out there. Okay, thank you. Do you know what I'm saying? So that we could kind of recycle it or at least repurpose it. Have you ever heard of that being done? That is done somewhat. There is there is one sticky wicket to that particular caveat, oh, isn't and that is this. Uh, we have to apply boron as part of our hydroponic solution because boron is an essential plant element. Okay. Boron is something that is, you know, in, it, it's deficient at 2 pounds to the acre, and it's toxic at about 40 pounds per acre. So there's a pretty fine window. And so we would like to spread that hydroponic fertilizer around just a little bit so that we don't have trouble with boron accumulation. But on a commercial farm, that would be no problem whatsoever. Okay. But I would be cautious about continuously dumping my waste hydroponic solution on my garden because if I keep putting it on the same 200 square foot, I could eventually wind up with boron toxicity. So that would be the one fly in the ointment, if you would. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, we've got a couple other chat box questions. Uh, you kind of touched on this. Does hydroponic growth affect the flavor of vegetables, particularly tomatoes, and does it affect the thickness of the skin, especially tomatoes? The thickness of the skin, probably not. It, 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 that's not so much nutrition as it is two other factors. One is environmental conditions. Is it cold and cloudy or is it warm and dry? That will affect skin thickness. And probably even bigger than that is the variety that you select has a great impact on fruit firmness and skin thickness both. Both of those are largely dictated and determined by variety. Um, as far as flavor, you know, I'm going to be really, really honest with you. You hear most people talk about how tomatoes don't taste as good now as they did when they were kids. There's probably some truth to that. If you will remember, which I don't know that I even touched on it, but when I talked about, showed the buckets that we're putting in hydroponic solution, I said a lot of our growers acidify, and we normally would acidify our water with sulfuric acid. The reason we acidify with sulfuric acid is that most of us think that sulfur probably increases the taste and makes tomatoes taste better. And so if we're going to have to acidify anyway, rather than using Phosphoric acid will use sulfuric acid because it imparts better flavor. I only bring this up because, you know, even in central Illinois, you know, if this was 25 years ago, we would never go out to a soybean field and sample it for sulfur. And the reason is there was so much sulfur falling on the ground through acid rain from all of the coal that was being burned to generate electricity, that sulfur was never deficient at all. We actually have cleaned up the coal burners and eliminated a bunch of them, and there's actually a lot of cases where sulfur has become lacking in soils, even in central Illinois. And that probably has as much impact on flavor as uh, anything else as to whether or not sulfur is sufficient or deficient. Okay, we got another one. Um, is there a specific material that the bags are made of that you're referring uh, to? Those grow bags? Yeah. Not, not that I know of, but they come pre-punched with holes in them. And if you guys are interested in looking at where you can get some of these kinds of supplies, um, you know, Hydro Garden H-Y-D-R-O-G-A-R-D-E-N. Hydro Garden is one choice. Um, 
Another choice that's good, if you go to um, uh, FarmTech, F-A-R-M-T-E-K, FarmTech has added a lot of hydroponic materials, and, and FarmTech is really good about, you know, if you only want to order 10 bags, you know, 10 grow bags, they don't have any problem selling you something like that, as opposed to places like Crop King that are geared to work with commercial growers. They really aren't very excited about selling 10 bags at a time. They want to sell cases of boxes of 1,000, you know what I mean? But, but FarmTech is pretty good about that. The other thing is, should you ever order one item from FarmTech, you will be able to light winter fires in your fireplace all year long because they'll send about three catalogs a week, I think. <laughs> Lots yeah, that's, of material. that's the truth for sure, yeah. Uh, okay, another one here. Um, they were asking about purchasing, so that's good. Um, do you know anything about Emily's Garden hydroponic system? I do not. I haven't seen it. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, any type of material that needs to be avoided for use? And I think they were referring back to the bags again. Uh, not that I'm aware of. I, I think, you know, in, in, in general, you know, we don't want, uh, for example, if you're going to make a floating raft, you know, and put visqueen over it, we probably want to stay away from railroad ties that are treated with penna or, or uh, 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 creosote. Um, <laughs> In general, though, I mean, I don't think any of the polyethylene materials is going to matter. Okay. Um, are there any vegetables that cannot or should not be grown? I would like to grow spinach and kale for my salad. What system would you suggest for my basement Sp for best results? Spinach and kale both work well in either of those systems. I mean, we've raised spinach and kale in, um, in the gutter type systems and they work absolutely well and we've also raised them where you just put them on top of for example dutch buckets where we've got perlite in the bucket and we just sprinkled the seed right on top and it, it works well in either system okay, okay um Brittany, i'm not sure i don't quite understand your question if you want to type that in again and then the last one is how much light is required indoors and, and that depends on what the crop is. Lettuce takes a whole lot less than tomatoes. Lettuce you can probably get by you running only fluorescent bulbs. If you start trying to do tomatoes, you're going to be looking at having to have uh, LEDs with or, or high, high input pressure sodium bulbs. I mean, it's going to be much more expensive to grow tomatoes in a basement setting than it is to grow them uh, outdoors, but but the greens in general uh, have a much lower light requirement. Okay, well that's all we've got for chat messages, so we'll see if anybody else has anything else. And hydroponics is great. You know, let me let me start by saying, you know, hydroponics is great stuff, and and the problem is, and you know, kind of our latest thing, we've been doing hydroponic stuff here for about five years at this point. Our latest thing that we've been working on for the last two years is looking at mushroom production. And I think both of them have the same problem in that this is what I think the problem is. As you're first trying to learn how to do this, if you read 15 different references from 15 different places, they will tell you 20 different things to do. It's the most bizarre thing I've ever seen in terms of consistency of the information that exists. Um, and, and in the end, at least in the case of hydroponics, I don't think it's quite as complicated as you would like to think that it is. Uh, and just dive off and try it. I mean, it, it really is top quality. The, the lettuce is beyond anything that you've ever eaten. If you've not eaten hydroponic lettuce, it is an entirely different commodity than lettuce produced in the soil. There is no bitterness to it whatsoever. It is just a superior commodity, period. Okay. Um, we've got two more chat questions. How many hours of light indoors then? Again, that would vary on, on crop. A lot of times if guys are running fluorescence, they may, may actually run them 24 hours a day. Okay. When you start dealing with high pressure sodiums or, you know, lights that are very expensive to grow, if you've got, you know, in Illinois, even in a greenhouse, if we were going to try to raise tomatoes in the wintertime, we would probably have to provide two hours of supplemental light uh, the entire month of December and first two weeks of January. 
in a basement, you're looking at probably trying to buy, provide a minimum of eight hours of light. Okay. And then also, is there a website you can recommend with more information or a good book on this subject? Uh, I wish. <laughs> um, no, I don't know that I know a great book or a, or a, a great website. Um, uh, again, from website to website, they, they really tend to change. You know, for example, if you're interested in lettuce, you could download the Cornell Lettuce Production Manual. It's free. It's a PDF. And they're going to talk about floating raft systems, which I said earlier is not my favorite. But a lot of the information in terms of what to use for nutrient solution and concentrations and lighting and temperature, all of that information is good, whether you're growing in gutters or a raft system. So I think that's a pretty good resource. Okay. If they're interested in tomato production, then I think they go to Mississippi State, and there's quite a bit of information from them. That's pretty good. Okay. What uh, about observation? You, oh, go ahead. I didn't hear him. I'm sorry. One question for you, Jeff. Yeah. And I'd like your opinion about this or your feelings about it. All this emphasis on this type of producing food, does it not force a separation of humans from Mother Earth and Mother I, Earth. I don't ability to sustain us. I I don't know the answer to that exactly. I mean, I think I could. I definitely could understand why you would have that viewpoint. I would argue that I could go into downtown Chicago where there is no green space for people to work in, go onto a rooftop, throw up a, a greenhouse structure and raise plants hydroponically and in fact it would be using this kind of system make people infinitely closer to one with nature rather than uh, causing them to be further divided. That's entirely possible. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, could, sure. could it? Yes, but it's a matter of perspective and I don't think it's an inherently evil system. They it's a matter of how it's used. They can grow carrots, I suppose. <laughs> Okay, well, thank got, you anyway. We've got one more. Uh, do you see production costs going down anytime soon? On the hydroponic stuff, I think those systems have gotten cheaper uh, over the course of the last uh, 10 years. So, yes, I think they are going down. Where you get into trouble is that a lot of the varieties that we would like to raise in a greenhouse environment, for example, in some cases we pay as much as a dollar a seed for some of the tomato varieties we raise which is a whole long way from the, you know, when you go down to Rural King and buy your tomato seed on clearance, 10 packs for a dollar. We got a question in Morgan County. Sure. sure. Jeff, you mentioned early on that it's difficult to do hydroponics with organics. Um, could you explain some of the problems with that or the disadvantages? I was interested in possibly trying a, a liquid whole fish fertilizer and uh, the, kind of shot me out of the water on that. Well, <laughs> the, the problem, and, and, and I'm not saying that it's, that, you know, I, I guess I would argue definitely, definitionally, I don't think it's possible, but we can use a system that looks exactly like this, only we're going to load the media with materials prior to setting our plants in it. For example, we would load materials into the coconut core prior to setting the plant in a bag system. Are you with me? Do you understand what I'm saying? You're talking about putting the liquid fish fertilizer in the in the. Meat. It wouldn't have to be liquid. It could also include elements like bone meal and 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 blood meal and some other things. But we would need to supply some of that stuff up front. And the problem with with trying to raise things on fish meal is is not that it won't work. It will. It's that we will wind up, though, losing some of the um, predictability. You know, that material in general, only a small amount of it is immediately plant available, and it decomposes over time to release additional elements. And so we don't have the same degree of predictability that we do with inorganic sources of fertilizer where every single element is a known part per million concentration in the solution. 
And so it, it, it can be done, but we don't get necessarily as much bang for your buck. I can tell you right now that one of our professors on campus, um, uh, Sam Wartman, is in fact, he and I are both looking at strawberry production and the stacking systems that we talked about here today. And he's going to devote about one half of his research project to looking at trying to do that utilizing uh, only hydroponic fertilizer materials. Organic hydroponic or just? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I meant to say only organic materials. I apologize. I misspoke. Okay. Um, has he considered possibly using any compost tea? Or have, do you know of anybody that's tried using yeah. that? Instead? Yeah. Yes. Again, you, you, you can, but you don't wind up getting everything. In other words, of the 16 elements required for plant growth, we're going to be looking at providing about 13 or 12 of those 16. We don't really worry about providing chlorine. We don't really worry about providing hydrogen or oxygen. But we do worry about providing things like boron and manganese and cobalt and copper and zinc and all kinds of things right. that become problematic in that the compost teas and the other materials do a good job of providing us with N and K. Sometimes they provide us with some phosphorus. Manures are great for phosphorus. In fact, they're so good that it can become a problem. Um, but we don't necessarily get all of our trace elements with it. And it's that trace element component that winds up becoming a problem in organic production in terms of for hydroponic systems. It's not a, it's not a problem at all in soil-based systems, but it can be a problem in hydroponic systems. Uh, would, would it be possible to use like a, a seawater concentrate for the trace minerals? It, it, it is, but again, we get problems with consistency in terms of driving the system at maximum efficiency. Again, Dr. Wartman is a good guy. I mean, you could visit with him more about organic uh, hydroponic production because uh, he definitely is more in tune of what the problems are and what his strategies are going to be for overcoming those problems. Okay, and what was his last name again? Wartman, W-O-R-T-M-A-N. He's also in Crop Science Department. Okay, well, thank you, Jeff. It's been a marvelous program. All right, well, I apologize for not having all the ins and outs of the of the organic. I just know that it becomes difficult because the materials that we want to use so that things are readily available um, wind up that a couple of them, particularly a couple of the trace elements, wind up having to come from inorganic sources. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys for letting me visit with you. I mean, I, hydroponics is cool stuff. By all means, go buy a small system and play with it. It is Mondo fun. It really, really, really is. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Hey, thank you. Bye, everybody.